All right, so today we are going to be taking a peek at solving quadratic equations by square roots. Like I said, we've done some graphing, we're going to be doing some stuff with factoring, but today we're going to be doing with square roots. So solve the equation, give exact answers, no decimals, show all your work. So we're going to be breaking down radicals here. So my first job is always going to be to isolate my x squared. Well, it's isolated already. So my opposite of squared is always going to be to square root it because then the squared and the square root are opposites, so they cancel in some way. But here's where I got to be careful. Okay, no decimals. But I need to simplify this still. This is where we go back to talking about some of the things like we did when we had this chart that we played with before. The perfect squares, I need two numbers that multiply to 60, but one of them has to be from that list. Hmm. Okay. So 15 and 4, because typically one will, be a, one will be a perfect and one will not be. Now, here's the other thing that we will talk about momentarily. The square root of 4 is perfect. It breaks down. The 15 isn't. When you have an x squared, when you have a quadratic, typically, almost always, that's why I'm going to say typically instead, you're going to get two answers. You're like, well, how am I going to get two answers here? Because whenever you take the square root, what's going to happen is you're going to have plus minus in front of your value. Because if you think about it, like let's say with a simpler number, let's say it was x squared equals 16. Well, 4 squared 16, we always think of that one. But also, negative 4 is a quantity would equal, squared would equal 16, because negative 4 times negative 4 is positive 16. So when I'm doing these, it's important that I remember the plus minus, because otherwise I'm only getting one of the solutions. And that's something you'd be able to see on the graphing calculator, too, if you'd plug it in. But again, whenever we're doing any of these, you've got to make sure you isolate your x squared. So like here, I divide it by 5. So once I do that, now I can go ahead, take my square root, and not everyone will break down more. Sometimes they won't. And if it doesn't break down anymore, I just put the plus minus in front of my square root, and I'm done. So you're like, okay. So it's like half solve an equation, and then basically just remember thank you, that it's going to be plus minus. So here I'd add my 8. I'd divide by 3, because again, I want to isolate that x term as best I can before I do my radical. Now, will there be some exceptions to some things sometimes? Sure. Sometimes will they break down? Sure. Sometimes they may break down completely. Like, for instance, on 4, what would be a wise thing to do first on 4? Sometimes that might be an okay idea, but here, that actually is going to make more work for me than less. So we don't want more work. Yes. If we multiply each side by the reciprocal, which in this case would be 3, that's going to take care of my fraction for me, which is a good thing. But we are in a little bit different of a situation this time than we were on the last couple of problems because my x is trapped inside this quantity, inside this set of parentheses. So this time, I've got to use the square root to get the parentheses out of my way. So those guys wipe out. Hey, this is nice and even. The square root of 36 is 6. So I got plus or minus 6 working here. So, so far it's not too bad. So you're like, okay, I still got to move that 4 over. But how exactly is this going to work? Because when I move that 4 over, when I subtract it, do I just subtract it from the 6? No. That plus minus kind of blocks me from doing that. So here's what we're going to do. I get negative 4 plus or minus 6. Now, 
whenever we can simplify in math, we know we need to. So I'm not just going to leave it. I'm literally going to break it up and say, OK, I got negative 4 plus 6. I got negative 4 minus 6. And I'm actually going to solve both of those. If it breaks down clean, take it all the way to the end and simplify it completely and get your two solutions. Now again, they're not always going to break down all the way. We've seen that already. But if it does, you need to. Okay, Not optional. See, like before and five are like the same. Why do we need to do two of these? Well, because there's a little different twist in this one. I'm still going to multiply by my reciprocal first because I don't like dealing with the fraction. And I still am going to take the square root because the squared is now in my way of getting to my x. But here's where things change. 60 doesn't break down clean like 36 did. That's unfortunate. But it does break down. We've sort of been down this road before. So I'm going to go ahead and break that down at this point. And then I still have to add the 5 over, but this is being blocked off by this plus or minus here still. I cannot, like I did on the last problem, I can't do like, oh, is it 5 plus 2 times this and 5 minus 2? No. Okay, That's as far as I can go with this one. Because otherwise I'd start changing the value of the problem. If I plug this into the calculator as 5 plus 2 square root of 15 or 7 square root of 15, I'd get a different answer. So I have to be willing to leave this alone and almost treat the radical as though it's a, an x or like a variable term. I wouldn't combine 5 plus 2x and try to make it 7x. That wouldn't make any sense. I'm not going to do it here either. So you're like, okay. So basically what you're telling us is isolate the parentheses if your x is in there, the x itself, the x squared if it's not. And then basically just start plugging away at these problems that way. And if you happen to be fortunate enough to get one that breaks completely clean, I'm going to go ahead and split that into its two values and go ahead and get my solutions. Other nice thing about these, unlike the ones that we were doing with radicals before, you're not going to have answers that don't work. Once you get to an answer on these, it's going to be good and ready to go. Otherwise, and again, we'll start mixing them up back and forth. Once we get to a point where your c squared or your x squared value is just there by itself, I'll add the 35. And then it's just solving. I'll divide by the 5, OK. And when I do my square root at the end on one like this, again, don't forget your plus minus. But if it doesn't break down, it doesn't break down. No worries, no worries with those. So let's see. I think 8 and 9 are good spots to go. And then I'm going to start trying to look for some weird ones. Again, just like before, when we had a fraction out in front, we're going to use the reciprocal to help us. So, OK, the squared's going to be there. Now, I will guarantee I will not be doing this in my head. 32. Four times five halves. Nice. It's nice when we can put together the decimal and the fraction and still get a whole number out. And then again, since the parentheses are in my way, we'll get that taken care of. Again, always plus minus on that square root step when we're solving a quadratic. 
And once again, we are fortunate enough that this is going to break down completely for me. <coughs> and I can knock my two solutions out. So your key is just taking the time to make sure you get all the way to the end of that last answer. So one more sitting here on the end. Let's take a peek at nine, then we'll kind of see where we're at here and how we're feeling with things. Now again here, even though the temptation is there, because you've been doing it since Algebra 1, do not distribute. Don't do it. It's going to make life harder. So we'll get that 22 out of here first. Because whatever's furthest away from the x value that we're trying to work with, that's where you want to start. And then I can get the 4 out of there because dividing by 4 in this case is actually going to get rid of the parentheses. It's not going to make it a quantity anymore because there's no exponent outside of it. Then I can add the 6 over and all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier to work with. I almost forgot my plus minus. That would have been bad. Now, if I'm thinking correctly, I think there's only one more twist on this side that I could throw at you, and I think it's going to be a number 13. So let's jump down there for a second. Get down to 13. Doesn't look too terrible at the start. Like, all right, minus the 8. Okay, negative 2x squared equals negative 11. Now, i got to keep reminding myself, no decimals. Divide by negative 2, I get 11 halves. Uh-oh. When I go to take my square root, remember, I can't have a radical in the denominator. So, i got to do a little rationalizing work. So I'm actually going to move over into this area because I wrote a little too big. So remember, when we're rationalizing, I can break those into two separate radicals. And since the denominator is what's messing with me here, I'm going to multiply both the numerator and denominator by that radical, the, whichever one's in the denominator. I used for both. So then 11 times 2 would be the square root of 22. 2 times 2 is 4, but the square root of 4 is 2. So if I happen to get a fractional answer that's still under the radical, I have to rationalize it. No decimaling, no just leaving it that way. And I believe that's the only one on this side that throws that twist. I think everything else... Yep, everything else comes out clean, comes out nice. So, nothing too bad. Any issues that we're running into so far? Okay, here's what I want to do then. I want to take just a moment, just a moment, to flip over to the other side. This is something I like to do post that last graphing quiz that we did. And even though you guys were super on it, I want to just make sure there's some certain things that we see from the equations as we're working through these. We're getting ready to keep moving on. So I want to take a look at three of these. I want to take a look at number two. I want to take a look at number five. And what is my other one? Oh yeah, that's the guy, number seven. Okay, so when you're looking at this, all the information off here except for the x-intercepts are things that most of the time we're gonna be able to do by just looking at it. So for instance, in number two, what's my vertex? One, two. One, two. Because it's the opposite, it's x minus h, the opposite of h and then k, good. 
So let's see. I know this isn't a question on here, but is this one going to open up or down? Up. Because my A value here would be 1, which means it's going to open up, which will help us with the next question. If it opens up, do I have a max or a min? Min, because my vertex would be down here at the bottom. My line or my axis of symmetry yep, is just the x value from my vertex, x equals 1, even though the line itself isn't just a point. I'm going to skip to the last question. We'll come back to the intercepts. Wider or thinner than y equals x squared? Or neither. Okay, it's just going to be the same because my a value is not changing. We assume when it's y equals x squared that my a value is 1. So if it's still 1, it's going to be the same. Now as far as your intercepts go, most of the time we're going to need to take a peek at a graph to do that. So let me swing this guy over. Just one more time going through, making sure we've got this intercept thing down right for when we need it. Okay, so now, before I go pressing button, I'm just going to go ahead and hit graph and take a look. Oh, hmm, where does it look like that graph crosses the x-axis at? It doesn't. Okay, there aren't any. Boy, we wish they'd all be that simple. Um, they're not, but... That's one thing. So you're not going to have x-intercepts every single time, depending on where your equation takes you. So now let's see here. Let's answer the questions again here for 5. What's my vertex in 5? 2, 4. Uh, up or down? Up, because my a value is 2 thirds. So we said before, up means a min. My vertex and my axis of symmetry go hand in hand. It's just the x value of my vertex. Now my a is 2 thirds. That's definitely not 1. Is this going to get wider or thinner? Wider. Because when my a value is less than 1, if it's fractional typically, it's going to get bigger. And if it's a bigger number, it gets thinner or skinnier. All right. Let's see how the intercepts go this time. Again, when you're dealing with fractions, parentheses is a good idea. Because again, the calculator is going to go by order of operations. And if we do something screwy, well, you know. Well, heck, I'm just picking the doozies so far. You're like, Hardy, we're not going to have to do any of these. Yes, we are. So again, just letting you see that a lot of times that you may not get it crossing the x-axis. I promise it will on the last one, though. I made sure of it. All right, last one here at number seven. All right, you know the drill. Uh, vertex, one negative six. We're opening up again. There's the one thing I didn't do. I didn't get it down. So all mins on the ones that we did here. But if it opens down, that's when my maximum is going to come. My axis of symmetry still continues to go with the x value of my vertex. If my a value is 4, wider or thinner? Thinner. Get those numbers greater than 1, it's going to be thinner. This time we will have intercepts. All right, let's check this out. Make sure everything's typed in good. Yay, there's actually intercepts this time. All right, so let's go find them. So again, that's second and trace. That gets me my calc. And I'm looking for zeros. No mins or maxes this time. So again, when I want looking for my left bound, once I'm where I think that zero is going to be, just a couple of clicks to the left for my left bound. Lock that in. Get back to where I think it is. A couple of clicks to the right. That's pretty good. And then I'll get back near it here for my guess. Let's see. 
most of the time when we're doing these, we're going to go to the hundredths place. Sometimes it may be tenths, but a lot of times it's going to be hundredths. So my intercept would be negative 23 hundredths, zero. But that's just one. That's just this one. So I'm going to do it one more time. So second and trace. Again, we're looking for a zero. Another name for next intercept. Let me get back over here. Okay, so I'm kind of close. A couple of clicks left. You're like left bound. It seems like it's more like under bound, but it also is to the left of that point. So that's why it says left bound. Let me get back to close here. A couple of clicks to the right. So now I'm to the right of it. That's good. Let's see what we get. All right. So about 2.22, let's say. Zero. So again, if you can do those things with any of these equations, you're easy when it comes to graphing, finding information, finding a focus, finding a directrix. It doesn't matter. You're going to have all the information that you need. But for today, our main focus being solving by square roots, your job is going to be to take care of this guy. And this guy, for future reference, will be in homework check number seven. He'll be the second assignment. That book page we've gotten done with over the last couple of days is the first. So we won't be seeing a homework check till next week, of course. I mean, oh, we just had one. So get this knocked out, and tomorrow we will start working on the story problems with these with our toss-up we'll call them instead questions.